You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, friends, Clever listeners. For the next few weeks, we're taking you on a little trip down memory lane. Clever launched in 2016, and since then, we've met so many talented folks and shared their fascinating personal stories that we thought we'd revisit a few of them. So we handpicked a selection of some of our favorites that are definitely worth a second listen. And if you miss them the first time, you are in for a real treat. We'll be back in September with some exciting and shiny new episodes for you. In the meantime, I hope you'll take us with you in your ears and in your hearts on all your summer adventures. I want to be with you on your bike rides, on your road trip, and lounging with you in a hammock. Okay, so we love and appreciate you a ton, and please do stay in touch on social. See you soon. Amy? Hi, this is Jamie. Amy, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, Hi, we're Kelly. All here. Hi, guys. Hi, Jamie. Hi, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie. I'm Amy, and this is Clever. Today, we're talking to the renowned and glamorous interior designer, Kelly Wurstler. Actually, she's much more than an interior designer. She's grown the Kelly Wurstler empire into a global lifestyle brand that encompasses lighting, furniture, home accessories, jewelry, residential and commercial interiors, as well as curated objet d'art that she hunts for around the world. You might be familiar with some of her statement boutique hotel designs like the Avalon Beverly Hills. She's released four books, including Modern Glamour, The Art of Unexpected Style, and most recently, Rhapsody. She's been recognized for her work by magazines such as El Decor, Wallpaper, and Architectural Digest, plus Vogue, as her fashion statements are as bold and stylish as her interiors. And she tells us all about her dreamy closet. Mm. She's also a hockey mom, wife, and all-around hardworking and lovely person. So let's talk to Kelly Wurstler. My name is Kelly Wurstler, and I live in Los Angeles. I'm a designer. I design interiors, furniture, lighting, bedding, fabric, all sorts of fun, amazing products. I'm a mom and a wife and an animal lover. And I'm super, super curious. Ooh, I love that. We are too. So we've got lots of questions for you. (laughs) We built this whole podcast on curiosity. So yeah. (laughs) So let's start at the very beginning. What was your childhood like? Where'd you grow up? What was your family dynamic? Well, I grew up in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. It was a uh, incredible childhood. It was really loving, very supportive. It was somewhat strict. My mom and dad were really about creating an incredible work ethic. My dad was actually an engineer. um, Mm. And my mom, I guess you would say, was a closet designer. So our house was always kind of in flux and things were always changing and being moved around. And so there was always this kind of creative spark at the house. Did you have siblings? Yes, I have a sister. Her name is Tammy. She's so wonderful, and and we're only 11 months apart. We're the same age for a month. And I had very young parents. My parents um, were 17 and 18 when they had my sister and I. So they were kids, too. (laughs) So it's great, great having young parents, you know, full of energy, you know, always, uh, you know, up for something fun and exciting and new. That does sound like a pretty awesome childhood. Um, Where does the strong work ethic come from? There's really strong women in my family. We would come from a working class. Um, My two grandmothers both worked. My one grandmother on my father's side, who had three children, worked in a factory, the same factory for 50 years, and had her three children and was an amazing mom. And then my mother's mother was also an amazing, strong woman. She worked at a law firm, again, for 50 years. And my mother, she's always worked. And so just having strong women and, you know, a great work ethic and, you know, just you're your own person. You're the person that's going to make things happen in your life and you have to go out and do it. Wow. So with an engineer for a dad and a a closeted designer for a mom and a household that was always in flux, did that sort of 
spark your creativity? And then did your parents support that in you? How did it start to show up in your childhood? You know, I was always drawing and um, I loved looking at books and again, just being, you know, a curious child. You know, when we would have family come to our house during the holidays, I would set up, I created this thing called the bunny shop and I would make things from egg cartons and I would draw photos and make little three-dimensional sculptures and I would color and I would lay them out on a table and I would put little prices next to them. And it was called, <laughs> it was called the um, bunny shop. And I literally would prepare like weeks ahead. So, I mean, I was like in the retail business before I even knew it. It was a shop. <laughs> <store>. <laughs> And, and it's so cute. Every birthday, my mother sends me things from the bunny shop and it's hilarious. And my boys, <laughs> we just love it. It's so cute. Oh, I bet it's fun for your boys to see those relics from your childhood, too, to kind of oh, put those yeah. generations together. Yeah, it's sweet. Really sweet. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> it's adorable. <laughs> Were there any childhood challenges that you felt like you had to overcome? Any sort of real character builders that you had to get through? No, I mean, I was pretty um, even keel, I guess you would say. I loved working. I love doing things. And I've always been this way. I'm not best at not having a lot of things to do. I find things to do. You know, when I was 12 years old, I set up a little business of babysitting. And I wanted to make business cards. And because in Myrtle Beach, there's tons of hotels there. So I had these business cards made. And then I would take them to the local hotels and offer, you know, my babysitting services. So I've worked forever. And then at 13, I worked in a little cafe. I mean, now, God, you can't do that. But um, then I was, <laughs> uh, you know, working. And then my mom and my stepdad had restaurants and I worked in those restaurants. And so just, you know, love working and meeting people and all that. Oh, <laughs> that's so fascinating. Did you enjoy food service? Yes, I did. You know what? I was, I'm, I still am pretty shy. I work on it every day, um, being a little more um, breaking out of my shell. But, you know, when I was younger, I was actually real painfully shy. And so working in a restaurant and interacting with the customers every day really helped. And yeah, I loved it. I loved meeting new people from, you know, all over and having conversations and learning about new things. Yeah. And I did it actually all through college and um, after college. And it was a you know way for me to support my business and to pay for college and, uh, and all that. I know you're, you're talking a lot about working, but at what point did you really discover creativity? Was it when you started creating all the things for the bunny shop and then you were like, hey, I actually really enjoy making these things and coloring. Or was it a little bit later when you were uh, maybe in high school? I went to a public high school in South Carolina. And I mean, my favorite class was art. And it was like the only class that just seemed like it just lasted like a minute. It went by so fast. And so I always knew that I wanted to do something creative and my family, you know, they would go to auctions. There would be different thrift stores and things that I would love going to with my mom. And so just going to, you know, just different auctions, I would explore. And I loved um, looking at just sculpture and old magazines and just records and things you would see at flea markets and auctions. And I was still drawing and making, you know, things from paper and things in middle school and high school. And then, you know, when it was time to decide what I wanted to do and where to go to school, definitely wanted to leave South Carolina. And, um, and I knew Boston, you know, was a great college town and there were incredible colleges and just a really great international city because I, you know, was in South Carolina and it's, you know, small. So I applied to Massachusetts College of Art and was accepted. I, I remember spending the whole summer creating this portfolio and I remember flying up there and I was so nervous and presented my portfolio to the school and I got in and I was just beyond, beyond excited. I assume that you grew up in a smaller town. So now you're in this big city. What was that like? It was amazing. You know, I wasn't exposed to a lot of museums in South Carolina and I hadn't been to Europe before. And so just going to the city and seeing all this amazing architecture and all these incredible museums and 
vintage clothing stores and thrift stores and just all this stuff. It was just, it was just a dream. I was having the best time. Did it just make your, your head explode? <laughs> it must have been so exciting to, to sort of have your horizons broadened so, so quickly. I mean, it was, it was, you know, it was incredible. And, uh, you know, when I got there, I, cause I paid my way through school. So the first thing I did, I actually went the summer before school started just so I could get acclimated and get an apartment and get situated. And I, got a job waitressing at a restaurant called Chow Bella, which is on Newberry Street. That was really incredible, just meeting all these different kids from all over the world and building these really great, strong friendships. And, you know, I would go to school during the day, and then I would come back to my apartment. I would do work. I would go to Chow Bella. I would work at night. And then I would go back to my studio space at night and probably get home at like 2 in the morning. And just did that constantly, just over and over. And I loved it. It was fun. It was hard, but it was fun. So what was your major? What did you specialize in? My first year, I actually majored in graphic design. And I love typography and I love graphics. And that's probably where my love of pattern came through. But I did that for a year. And then I just decided that I really wanted to explore things. I love, you know, three-dimensionality. I love architecture. So I took a course in architecture, studied that with interior design. Did you feel like you got a great education there? Did you have a full rounded experience with lots of friends and experimental broadening situations? And did you feel like you got to really like learn your own voice in terms of your creativity there? Or did that come later? You know, I mean, I always followed my heart. And I still do. I mean, you just have to go with your intuition and what you feel. But it was such an incredible experience for me just to see so many things that, you know, I'd never seen before. I would spend a lot of time in Boston, but then I would also go to New York for a weekend, maybe every few months and, and explore that city and the architecture and the museums and the flea markets and all those vintage stores, which were incredible. It was really um, educational, social, and, you know, just a beautiful time for me. When you were at college, were there any particular teachers or mentors or did you intern for anybody that inspired you in any way or shaped kind of where you went with your career? We had the opportunity for an internship and there was a artist and interior designer, and he actually does graphic design. His name's Milton Glazier. Oh, yes. That's a big name. (laughs) (laughs) He was in New York. So I applied for an apprenticeship. So it was during um, the course of the summer. The beauty of that experience is, is he does graphic design, but he also does interior design. And he has such a, a voice, a specific voice. And, and super unique. So I went there for, for the summer and that was, that was really great. Wow. I bet that was incredible. Yeah. And it was awesome. What a cool opportunity. They only accepted, I think like four students every semester. So I, again, prepared my portfolio and put tons of work into it and was accepted. And yeah, I was beyond thrilled. That sounds amazing. Totally. Let's fast forward a couple of years. I'm really curious that uh, you worked in the film industry for a little bit. What was that like? Well, actually, while I was in Boston, there was a movie that was being filmed there. And um, and I thought that maybe like for some reason I knew I was always going to end up in California. I didn't know anyone in California. I just just loved how it looked and the weather, which is very similar to South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And so there was a movie that was being filmed during the summer. And so I uh, applied to work in kind of the art department. Um, I ended up getting a position as a production assistant. I really was exposed to, because it was a smaller movie, but I was really exposed to all the different aspects of working on a film. I made probably a thousand cappuccinos. That was like (laughs) really what I did. (laughs) So it was a fun experience. And then I thought maybe I would want to work in the art department, be a production designer. I really decided I want to do interior design and work in architect. So it was very short lived, but it was fun. Yeah. And I can kind of see the sense of drama 
even though, you know, you're not in the film industry, but having had that experience, I wonder if that has some, I don't know, subconscious contribution to the way that you design um, because your spaces are just, I don't know, they're, they emanate this quality of like Hollywood and excitement and like a set. Oh, that's, that's so nice. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I never actually really thought about that, but you know, the, the kind of the voice of, of my work, it's, it's, you know, I love pattern. I love color. And I think a lot of that comes from just my love of graphic design and decorative arts. But I do love, I love Hollywood. I love movies. I'm inspired by movies. It's fantasy. It's creating an experience. Mm -hmm. um, It's something beautiful. So you started Kelly Wurstler interior design in the mid nineties, right? Uh, Yes. Did you have any sense that it would become what it is today? Such an, such an empire that you've built. (laughs) I don't know if I use the word empire. (laughs) Um, You know, I always have had big dreams and goals. And again, I didn't know exactly what direction I was going in, in terms of, again, graphic design or architecture design, but I knew that it was going to be in the design world. And just, I've always been, you know, really driven, you know, it it just kind of just happened organically. And over time, I knew I, I for sure wanted to be my own boss. I'm definitely a perfectionist and I love being in control and doing things in totality. You know, and when I moved out to Los Angeles, I had one friend who I actually had met in Boston. He had had a friend that had a house that they just bought and they needed help with their dining room. So I said, sure, you know, I'll do it. And um, so I did the dining room and they loved it. And then I ended up doing the entire house. And then somebody came over and saw their house. And then I got another job. And then it just, it grew from there. Oh, that's so organic. Yeah. You know, and it is, it's starting, it's word of mouth and doing, of course, you know, you want to, you know, do a great job. And, um, but yeah, it was total, um, you know, organic growth for sure. Those first couple of jobs, were you on a shoestring budget or did you have the good fortune of having clients who had some money to spend so you could really do uh, your best work? It was shoestring budget for sure. I would get up on Sunday at five in the morning. I would go to the flea market and I would find all these amazing finds. I would have my flashlight, go to Rose Bowl, Pasadena City College, all these great, you know, flea markets. And literally I would have like this cart and I would put the chair, ask the guy who I bought the chair from, put it in the cart and then load it in my car. And so (laughs) I was like doing everything, delivery, (laughs) procurement, curating, the whole thing, you know, but that's where you start. And it, you know, it was so fun. It was like just finding that, you know, diamond in the rough at the flea market and bringing all the treasures back to the, to the client. What is it that appeals to you so much about the treasures at the flea market? I know for me personally, I really like that they come with sort of pre-existing histories that they've already been used and, and loved and they live through a different time period than I have. And that makes them feel like they have depth and soul. What, what appeals to you about these finds? I like the discovery and I love just being curious and, and looking for just something beautiful and something unique and finding those incredible anomalies that maybe something was done by an artist that nobody knows. And he could be just as good as Picasso and just discovering and, and training my eye and educating my eye and, uh, and all of it is just, it's so fun. I mean, I still love it. I, I don't go to the flea market as much cause I am a hockey mom and I have to get up early and <laughs> go to hockey games. But, um, you know, it's, it's the best thing in the world just in search of something beautiful and maybe that you've never seen before. Maybe it's something you have seen before, but it's in another color or it's been reinvented. Have you trained your eye to the point where you can just like walk up and down the aisles pretty quickly and like just scan everything and, and you can see something out of the corner of your eye and be like, that's it. I am so fast. I can go into a store and just look around and take pictures See what is special and unique and beyond to the next, for sure. Just educating your eye. And, you know, for example, if I send, say, a junior designer to a 
shop and ask them whether it's contemporary or it's a vintage store. And I ask them to take photos of furniture or lighting. And they come back with things that are very kind of somewhat common. And I'll go back to the store maybe a week later, and there's some really incredible things there. And it's just having educated my eye. And I prefer, I love things that are unique and the anomalies in the world and love using those in my designs. You know, it's special. I like things that feel fresh and new. And so it's interesting. You're known among other things for kind of shaping the course of boutique hotel design. And I live in Los Angeles and I remember the Avalon Beverly Hills being a very exciting project. For me, it was just an exciting place to visit. I even had my my bridal shower there. Was that your first hospitality project? And if it was, can you talk about how that came about and your process? So yes, it was my first hospitality project. And how I got this is kind of a interesting story. When I moved to LA and I was starting my interior design business, and I swore when I actually left Boston that I'm so done with waiting on tables and I'm ready to like <laughs> move on and um, you know create something for myself. When I got to LA, lo and behold, I had to pay my rent. So I had to get a waiting table job and I did. But something amazing happened. This girl, Marcy, who's actually a very good friend of mine, she was an actress and she also waited tables at this restaurant. She started going out with this guy. I guess they were dating. It turned out that I was introduced to this guy who just moved here from Chicago and he was in the real estate business. So I started doing work with him. He was acquiring some of these like vintage and historic apartment buildings. And so I would go in and give new fresh paint colors, do something interesting in these lobbies, you know, install really beautiful lighting. It turned out that this person had just found a hotel, which was the Avalon Hotel, an incredible mid-century hotel that was built um, in the 1950s. And so I said to him, you know, I've been doing all this work and you guys, you know, have been so happy. Can I please have the opportunity to do the design of this hotel? So, of course, you know, there's a group of investors They said, okay, you do a model room because when you do a hotel, you have to do a model room and you have to establish what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. Um, And everyone, of course, has to agree because before you go and buy hundreds of, you know, chairs and beds and tables, you have to make sure that it's functional, it looks beautiful, you know, ready to go. And so when I did the model room, all the investors loved it. So I got the job which is so exciting. Oh, yeah, that must have been super exciting. I brought in an architect who had done a hotel before, and I found uh, Koning Eisenberg, an awesome architectural firm in um, Santa Monica. They were really great. I learned so much from them, and it was just really such a pleasure. Was that job ever, like, so big that it was scary, or were you just thrilled the whole time? (laughs) There's a difference between shopping and curating a residential project as opposed to doing a hotel project because there are different vendors and fabricators. There are different codes that you have to design around. So it was, I mean, just looking back, it was really, really challenging, but it was fun. It was just an incredible learning experience and creating something that so many people can experience and enjoy is just, you know, wonderful. Well, I was going to ask you about the experience that you created because the Avalon Beverly Hills is one hotel, but I actually had my bridal shower there, I mentioned, but then I had my wedding at what's now the Avalon Palm Springs. I'm not married anymore, but the wedding was amazing. And that was particularly because the sense of space that was created. First of all, the architecture, the bones of the resort were really good and really worked for what I wanted for the wedding. But then you added this like level of glamour and drama and tranquility that just really created this ambiance that was astounding. So thank you. I had a wonderful time. (laughs) That's so nice. Thank you. I wonder when you start a space like that, you know, you're creating an environment, which is a collection of individual elements, but they have to work as a whole. What are your, what are your primary goals in creating an environment like that? That property was really unique because part of it was from the twenties. There are these little Spanish bungalows 
And then there was another section that was built, it was kind of like a motel style unit that was built in the 60s. And there's so you have this incredibly diverse architecture on one property. So really to create one cohesive experience is really just establishing like a voice to the property. And, you know, I wanted it to feel, I mean, Palm Springs, it's so hot there. I looked at you know, the coloring, you know, there's beautiful lemon trees that are on the property, keeping it really light and crisp, playing into that kind of citron yellow. And we had these certain graphics that were used to kind of bring the the different architectural um, voices together. You know, I wanted it to feel like Palm Springs, this lush landscaping. We used a wall covering in some of the bungalows that was just a black and white silhouette of branches you know, so the inside outside has this great dialogue. And really, it's about storytelling. You know, as soon as you walk into the lobby, I mean, you're setting the tone for your experience It's going to be, you know, at the property. So your studio churns out all kinds of amazing design work. You mentioned some of it at the top of the show. But can you elaborate a little bit about all of the goodness that's flowing out of the Kelly Wurstler brand? <laughs> sure. We do interior design and residential, which I love. And commercial, and within commercial, we do hotels, and we also do retail projects. We also design furniture, lighting, fabrics, wall covering, dinnerware, rugs, uh, many different uh, bedding. We're actually launching bedding, which is amazing. So many different types of products. It's the best to have that in your day. I can go from designing a residential project into the next few hours, I'm in a furniture design charrette and it's just this amazing cross-pollination that happens that I mean my day goes by in like five minutes. Do you have a particular product or part of your design that you like the best? Do you like to design products or textiles or do you prefer interiors? I, you know I love it all. I really do. It maybe it sounds cliche but I truly love everything because like the beauty of my work is I get to touch so many mediums and it just keeps me on my toes. Well, it seems like there's never a dull moment. So it keeps you, keeps you going every day. How big is your team at this point? My team is about 46 people in the actual studio in West Hollywood. There are 38 designers and then I have a warehouse downtown and then I have the flagship boutique. So all together, it's uh, about 48 to 50 people. That's impressive. So what kind of a boss are you? Oh, <laughs> How would your employees answer <laughs> that question? I would say, you know, I, I'm a great listener. And I think that's really important. You know, I really love having fun. And I love the office energy to be really great and positive. I'm serious about my work. I work really hard, but I also want to have a great time doing it and grow and learn from all this talent that's at my studio. And I really enjoy all the people that work there. And it's a team effort. It, it really it really is. And we all learn from one another because many of us have different skill sets. We'll have a graphic designer. We have a architect, chair designers, furniture designers painters, you know, all over. And we all learn from each other. And it's great to go up to them and say, actually, can you come over here and look at this? What do you think? And just getting feedback and growing. So I have a couple of follow-up questions. You've mentioned already uh, that you're a perfectionist and that you're shy. Do either of those influence how you manage your employees? I would say, like, I'm more of, like, a perfectionist in terms of, like, I want to have, like, the end product be the best it can be. High standards. Yeah. And, you know, it's a service business that I'm in and I'm here to make the client's experience, the final outcome, the absolute best it can be. And so I just expect to have people, you know, just in the studio who absolutely have a passion just like I do and work hard to have the best possible outcome. Nice. And so shy <laughs> um, and pertains <laughs> I, um, you know, I would say, you know, I do not like confrontation. Okay. I do not like dealing with human resource issues. 
Right. <laughs> I just like being happy and, you know, creative. But, you know, stuff comes up and you deal with it the best way you can. And, you know, everyone grows from all these experiences. Absolutely. So I'm very curious. I follow you on, on Instagram and you always post really beautiful, inspirational images. And I, I'm interested in your creative process because I feel like your style is so incredibly unique and so you, but I'd love to know where you're getting your ideas from. Are they coming from just the flea market or nature or, you know, how do you get inspired? Everything. It, it really is going to the museum it's being aware. It's being aware of your surroundings. I mean, you could be in downtown LA sitting on a bench somewhere and really looking at the architecture and somebody walking by and it's like, God, oh, they got a cool outfit on. Oh, those colors they have on are so cool. I love that. So it's just being aware. I have a library at home and I've been collecting new and vintage books since high school. So that is a huge source of my inspiration. I do like Pinterest. Although I love books, I think, you know, if somebody just stays on Pinterest, then everything starts looking alike. So I think you have to be really careful of that. I love history. I love contemporary design, modern art. I love sketching, you know, and sometimes I'll just wake up and I'll have an idea of something. And so I'll sketch, uh, I'll take it to the office. We'll work on, you know, whatever this idea may be. And I also love going to workshops. I love going to a a metal factory. I love going to a stone yard. You become a better designer when you see how things are made, how things are put together. Oh, I so agree. I'm so happy to hear you say that. Yeah, going to the foundry, seeing how things are cast, just going to where, you know, rugs are made. And that's how you can find your own voice is when you know how something is put together, you truly can just keep pushing it. And so... That's my creative process in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> so of all the types of projects that you do, which ones are the most challenging, but, you know, in a growth oriented way, which ones sort of make you push yourself and broaden yourself? I, I guess you would say all projects are challenging because you want to create something new and creating something new that maybe nobody's seen or that it's something new for a client. You know, I love my residential clients to have a voice and to be super involved in the project because they are my inspiration and they push me to try things that maybe I wasn't interested in or, you know, so I, we have a client we're working on now. It's incredibly minimal and it's all about materiality and architecture and statement pieces. And yes, that's challenging, but it's so awesome. But again, the client is the inspiration. I'm fascinated to hear you talk about where you get all your inspiration and how you love to visit the flea markets. And you have these laser beam eyes that you can really hone in on what's unique and interesting to you. And I wonder if you're picking up, you know, influences from all over with so many antenna. How do you feel about knockoffs and appropriation versus sort of celebration and attribution? And more specifically, how do you think members of the design industry can support each other in protecting their original designs? Yeah, I mean, knockoffs can be incredibly annoying, you know, and I, I really don't take offense to it. Everything has been done. It really has. It, but it's putting your spin on it and your stamp on it. You know, when we design something, I do that design and I move on and I don't have a formula. I think you have to keep surprising your audience. In terms of knockoff, it really is hard to protect yourself, especially in the world of Pinterest and social media and everything is so accessible, which then things can get quickly gentrified. And, you know, we have people that come to, you know, do interviews for positions at the studio. And I see so many people have the same images and it all has come from Pinterest and it just all starts looking the same. And when you have somebody that comes in who has a truly unique spirit and design vibe, it truly stands out. So 
if you do have that and you are knocked off, I mean, you just move on to the next. It's like you just keep going. Just consider it a compliment and move forward. Yeah, you just keep foraging along and you can protect yourself. I mean, you can have things copywritten and they're trademarks, but it's still, you know, really, really difficult. We've had issues with some of our patterns, but, you know, you just keep going. You can't get, you know, super bummed out about it. Yeah, I think that's good advice. We've talked to a couple of designers who have said something similar where, you know, the best way to fight knockoffs is to keep designing something new and fresh because they need to keep up with that. And you always should be like one step ahead. It's, it's a disservice to them for, for copying. I mean, people should try and create your own voice and your own spirit. And that's how you're going to excel in the design world. I agree with that. I think there's a a flip side to that, though, which is in a a small boutique manufacturing situation. If there's a lot invested in overhead and R&D and that product is their bread and butter and it gets knocked off and their bread and butter gets pulled out from underneath them, it can shut down a business. That's one of the real dangers of knockoffs. But it's one of those evils that you really just have to get very adept at, at steering around, I suppose. Yes, absolutely. I mean, and, and it's in any business. It's in the food business. It's in fashion. It's just, it's just part of the world we live in, and you just have to forge ahead. So in terms of your business growing, you know, you're doing so many different kinds of design work, and I feel like in the past couple of years, I've seen all these new products and new you know, collections coming out of your, your design brand, have you ever felt like it was just moving too fast? And and how have you handled this explosion of growth? Yes, of course. You know, sometimes it seems like it's moving super fast and like, holy shit. (laughs) (laughs) I have so much to do today, but there's so many cool opportunities that excite me. And I've made mistakes by doing too much And you just get in this, it's like your days are so hectic and frantic and it can be stressful. So I really try and manage like the projects, you know, that we take on, but it's so fun and I'm so passionate about it. You want to keep doing more. So I'm trying to maintain, you know, a good balance, but yeah, it can be challenging for sure. I I have a personal business question. I'm just going to use this podcast to get advice for free. (laughs) <laughs> um, <laughs> so I run the blog Design Milk and I have people working with me, but I'm still kind of the funnel or the bottleneck for everything. And, you know, you own your own business and the business is your name, right? You kind of are the brand. Is there a way that you've been able to manage still keeping your hands in everything and yet being able to grow? That's such a good question. It really is. You know, I have gone through that in the last five years. There still is a bottleneck, but it's actually gotten better. And really giving my team, you know, the people that you bring on to do a job, the chance to shine and not to micromanage, you know, and I have in the past, like micromanaged and, you know, of course that's not good. And really giving my talented team the chance to shine and you'll be so surprised and then you just give them more accountability and more challenges and uh and you see like beautiful things will happen yeah i think that's great advice there's probably a lot of designers that are listening who are in the situation where they've created a design studio under their name and they're trying to figure out how to take it to the next level without you know overdoing it or, or giving themselves too much pressure or too much work and you know, it can be a challenge to expand your own business if you are the person who's constantly having to approve everything. It does. It it takes a village. It really does to make things happen. And you hire and bring on a talented team and you, you need to just give them the wings and let them go. It can be a little scary and mistakes happen, you know, as people continue to forge along it'll just get easier and easier. So I I think, yeah, in general, if you give people a chance to impress you, they're going to do their best to impress you. But there is going to be like a learning curve, especially with new employees, while they get the feel for how you operate and what your style is. And as a boss, do you feel like you just have to be patient through that learning curve? You have to communicate and you have to teach people along the way. 
and things that, you know, for example, we're working on a project right now and the team suggested all these, you know, really beautiful light fixtures for this project that were designed, you know, I'm like, you guys, it's just, it's going to be so expensive. I don't mean to be Debbie Downer, but it's going to be super expensive and it's just super complicated. So you kind of have to pick your battles in terms of where you put focus and where you put the effort of the studio and also the money. And it's, it's a balancing act. And so, yes, I really try and educate the team and mentor them and uh, give them the tools to make better decisions, you know, as long as they're at the studio and, you know, leading also their team on projects. So over the course of your career, you've won too many awards to mention. You've secured yourself as a household name in the design world. I'm wondering if there is an award, an acknowledgement, an accolade or something that means the most to you. Maybe it happened at the right time in your career when you needed a boost. Maybe it was the one thing that like validated you when you weren't feeling the best, or maybe it was the thing that was a big break. It opened a new door for you. Is there something that stands out as the most important award? You know, I don't know if it's an award, but the first time one of my projects was published in the magazine was so incredible. And it was actually, it was an El Decor. And this is when everyone was doing shabby chic and everyone had like the iron beds and everything was white. And I was Mm -hmm. doing color and mixing um, different periods of furniture and was recognized for just following my heart and doing something that I just felt was true to my, my vision was so amazing. And then most recently, I was awarded the International Designer of the Year Award with Spanish AD, which was such a huge honor because it's just one of my favorite magazines. I think it's so, so inspirational. I get so excited every month getting it in the mail um, and online. I get both. <laughs> <laughs> and the people were so amazing. They just treated me like a queen. And I was there for about four days. It was really, really special, really special. I'm wondering what aspect of your work other than, you know, outside validation, awards and accolades, gives you the most sense of purpose and fulfillment that helps you sleep at night so content with the contribution you're making to society? Seeing people in the spaces I designed, I would Mm -hmm. say. Seeing people um, interact in the spaces, whether it's a hotel or a residential project. And, you know, I was just in New York and shooting a project that we um, designed a townhouse that we worked on for about four years. And so the clients were there and I said, you know, you know, do you love the house? You know, if I could have done something different, what would have been, is there things that you're not using? Because it's great to ask those questions because it just makes you, you know, you learn from, from every experience. And they were just so appreciative and just said, we absolutely love it. And, you know, moments like that are just so special So just having happy clients and customers, that is, you know, the best. I think that is my favorite aspect of just being able to, like, create a space that other people get to interact with and that enhances their life. It's awesome. Yes, absolutely. What stresses you out? Because, you know, obviously we have life stressors, you know, stressors as a parent, stressors as business owners. What is like the most stressful thing for you? The most stressful thing for me is, is trying to do it all. It really is. You have to make compromises or things you miss out on, you know, managing my family who come first and foremost and work. You know, I'm a hockey mom and my boys also are in a band and they surf and just do so many activities. And so I really am there um, for them. I drive them on the weekends. My husband and I, they're on two different teams. And then I have work I have to do. And so just managing all that can be definitely hectic and it gets frantic and you get stressed. And of course, there's like beautification, exercise, eating right, getting my hair and nails done. You know, it's so much stuff. A working mom, you know, you you unfortunately miss out on some things, but I, at the end of the day, I, I want my boys to see me happy and fulfilled and, you know, all different parts of my life. And also, you know, the hard work, you know, pays off. 
I'm stressed out listening <laughs> to you. I'm overwhelmed. It's too much. Exhausting. Too much. <laughs> I sleep well. I sleep well. <laughs> I just hate the question, you know, how do you do it all? Because, you know, we never ask that to to men. Of course, we only ask the women, how do you do it all? But it is exhausting. You know, I have a daughter, I have a family, I have a business, I have a podcast and there's, there's a lot and you do have to make compromises. And I I appreciate that you, you said that out loud because if anybody's listening, you can't do it all. (laughs) Yeah, it's impossible. It really is. It's impossible. But, you know, you do the best you can. Well, your best is pretty fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, you know, we always on this podcast, we delve into the personal life a little bit. I am guessing just to kind of pull this story around in, into a circle, that real estate developer that you met when your career was getting going, is that also your husband and the father of your kids? Yes. That's the beautiful thing that happened when I had to go back waiting tables so sadly when I came to Los Angeles is I got the job and the girl that trained me, my friend, she actually introduced me to my husband. Oh, wow. (laughs) I worked in that restaurant for like six months. It was really rough, but you know, something beautiful happened. I met my husband. Yeah. Sometimes the most difficult situations yield the prettiest flowers. Absolutely. That's so well said. Are you a spiritual or religious person? You know, I would say I'm more spiritual. I love traditions of religion. I love celebrating many of the religious holidays, and our family celebrates many of them. It's about being a good person, helping others. I love animals, giving back. You know, I always tell my boys, I'm like, you have to make sure you do something really nice to somebody every day, and just kind of always having that in the back of your head, being thoughtful and caring. So I can't let you go without asking at least one fashion question because your style is as glamorous and as unexpected as the work that you put out in interiors. Oh, thank you. I just want to know, how do you manage your closet at home? Do you have like a giant walk-in where everything's like organized and your shoes have Polaroids on the shoe boxes or what happens there? (laughs) Well, I would say, again, organization is like super, super important. But my closet is actually, and actually I'm sitting in my closet now. It's kind of my little like girl cave, I guess you would call it. (laughs) I I come in here, I like sit on the floor and it's like quiet. So it's like a long and narrow closet and there are three skylights. So you have amazing light and the skylights have UV protection because I know a lot of people are like, oh, it's going to fade my clothes. But anyway, so as UV protection, all of my shoes are exposed because shoes are my weakness and they are little sculptures. Oh, you always Mm -hmm. have great shoes. (laughs) And everything is is put together by color. So say my pink shoes are all together and my black shoes. So everything is color coordinated in one area. This is closet porn right now. I'm, (laughs) I'm feeling like... I'm having a physical reaction to this. <laughs> Keep going. And then all of my drawers, I probably have in this closet probably like 60 drawers. And they're only about four to six inches high because when you open the drawer, you're in a hurry and you want to see just all the shit that's in the drawer. So just one layer of stuff. Yeah, it's super easy. And everything's labeled on the inside of the drawer. So it doesn't look messy from the outside. All my hats are together. I collect parasols because I try and protect myself from the sun. So I have these UV protected parasols that I get in Japan. So I love parasols. I have a little collection of parasols. My handbags and clutches are all segregated in one area and they're divided with these glass panels. So you can see through them. The visibility of all the handbags is much easier. And what else? I love everything about what you're saying. I love everything about it. I have lots of hooks and things for, you know, when I have fashion drama and there's everything's on the floor and I don't want to leave a mess. So I throw everything on the hooks and that's about it. It's just super organized. I love the one layer drawers. I think everything should be like that. And the glass organization so that you can still see, but you can keep things separate and you can stack things on top of each other. Everything about that just totally appeals to me. And I have too, like this one little area that was in the closet and it was only about four inches deep. And so I built these shelves and on these four inch deep shelves are all these like little bowls and little dishes that I have accumulated over my life. And in these little bowls and dishes are jewelry. 
So I'll have like earrings and rings and I just open up this cabinet and it's like all there. That's like my hardware cabinet. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so you can kind of just see everything at one, you know, glance and it looks pretty. Awesome. That sounds amazing. All right. I have to step up my closet game now. <laughs> we all do. We all do. You just set the bar really high. I'm excited. It's a challenge. <laughs> Okay, so before um, you mentioned betting is something that's next, is there anything else that you have coming up that you want to talk about? We're actually designing a new brand of hotels. We have four in the works now. There's one in San Francisco, one in Austin, Texas, and then one in Santa Monica and downtown Los Angeles. The first one launches in San Francisco in um early summer of next year. Well, we will definitely keep an eye out for that. Mm -hmm. I split my time between LA and San Francisco. So I'll be interested to see when that new hotel opens in San Francisco. What are you calling it? So it's proper hotel. It's going to be really awesome. Great design, great food and beverage, just, you know, real cool experience. Where is the best place for our listeners to keep up with you on social media and on the internet and learn all about everything that you're doing? Well, we have a really great e-commerce site where, you know, many of the products are for sale and Instagram, which I love, Snapchat, also love, so fun, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, you know, all the different social media outlets. Well, it's been so lovely talking to someone who's so engaged with life and so curious. And you must have laser beams for eyes when you <laughs> scour the globe for things that you find interesting and unique. Thank you so much for sharing your, your life and your stories with us. Oh, thank you, Amy. Thanks, Jamie. I thank appreciate you. it. Well, if you're ever in West Hollywood, please swing by the studio. Oh, oh I and would say love hi. that. I would love to do a studio visit. That sounds amazing. Yeah, you should. I love going to people's studios. It's so, you see how they organize for one and you can just see, you know, everything that goes down there. I'm totally going to take you up on that. Thank you so much, Kelly. Okay, guys. Have a great day. All right. Bye. I'm so enamored You know, I think I love her a little bit more that she acknowledged to us that she's painfully shy. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That just makes her personality make a lot of sense. And it's very sweet. And I can just imagine that she's a very sensitive person, which sometimes we forget when somebody's so glamorous and has this very like manicured and even chiseled persona that they present to the outside world. Mm -hmm. You can forget how sensitive they can be on the inside. And she was incredibly, I don't know, she had a little like sweet Southern Mm -hmm. little way about her that was so endearing, I found. Yeah, it really was. And when you think about a brand like hers that has become so larger than life and, and feels bigger than just her, you forget sometimes that there is a human being behind Mm -hmm. this brand. And I think it was really great and it just feels more approachable Um, now that we've had that conversation with her. And I have a lot of respect for her rigorous work ethic. I'm overwhelmed personally, like all the stuff that she does every day and all the situations she gets herself in with so much high stimuli. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's like provoking anxiety. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, we might forget that she gets up probably at 5 a.m. on Saturdays or Sundays and goes to hockey practice or drives her kids to their games and stuff like that. So you know, there's a lot more involved in her life than just the, the business itself. It made a lot of sense to me. And I'm also very relieved that she's so organized because I think the only way you can get through all of that chaos is to instill a sense of to order. To have four to six inch drawers in your closet. Oh my God, how awesome was that closet porn? I was feeling like that was kind of a stupid, like fluffy question. But then when she started going into it, I was like, oh, tell me more. No, I really want to do like MTV Cribs and like just go into her closet. (laughs) Maybe we can try and hit her up for an image Mm -hmm. um, for our show notes from that closet. Oh yeah, we can try to do that. It sounds so awesome. And you know, she was pretty candid about things like protecting herself from the sun. It's no secret that she's, you know, very photogenic and she's, you know, model-esque and a presence in many of her photo shoots. Mm -hmm. I'm glad she doesn't try and downplay it. Like, no, I'm just, I woke up like this. (laughs) (laughs) No, she talked about beautification and that that's part of her life and an important aspect of her life. And yeah, she's a badass boss lady. She's a mom. She's a wife. She's all of these things. And she likes to take care of herself and she still likes to look nice at the end of the day. And I think that's like, you know, high five. Yeah, totally. High five. Thanks for listening. 
please subscribe to Clever on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and sign up for our newsletter, read the show notes and see images of Kelly's work and her amazing closet on cleverpodcast.com. Mm-hmm. And definitely connect with us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at Clever Podcast because it's super fun to have a back and forth with you guys. This episode of Clever was edited by Chris Modal of Your Studio with music by L1011.